Pastor John Peters, who will be giving us the Sunday devotional followed by the Lord's Supper. Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, I think all of us uh, would want to say to you, we love you. And we thank God for you. And I think of a, a passage in Scripture that says, uh, the, the Apostle Paul says, uh, ask for all this, the care of all the churches. And you have that kind of a ministry that you, can, you see what's going on in that church, this church, that fellowship, this fellowship. And, you know, the enemy of our souls is busy creating havoc everywhere. And so that all weighs on you. Some of us have enough with just one church to worry about and fellowship. So we, I know you don't like sort of personal things, but I, I think we all want to say to you a really big thank you for Morial Conference. Yeah. Yeah. And can we pray for him? And if you want to just hold your hand out towards him, let's, let's do this. Father, we do thank you for Jacob, and we pray, Lord, that what all these things that have been going on in the background and most of us can't imagine what pain it causes when a dear friend seems to uh, be saying bad, evil things about you or, or disrupting your ministry. I pray, Lord, that you'll protect him from bitterness of spirit. I pray, Lord, that you will speak peace into his heart. And I pray, Lord, we pray that you will bring healing to Jacob so that he can do the things that he wants to do. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Your prayers are coveted. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there's loads of people to thank, isn't there? So I better not get into that. I'll but do that. You do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, as we draw near to the table of the Lord, and in a few moments, time will be breaking bread according to your word, would you prepare our hearts, Lord? We're reminded how much of a serious business it is, as well as a joyful thing. For the Apostle Paul says that some people have been sick and fall, and even passed away because of uh, the way they've handled coming to communion and being there with fellow brothers and sisters and out of fellowship with them and so on are in the wrong place. So we don't do this lightly, Lord. And, uh, and we pray that you'll prepare us to, to together meet around your table and recognize you are with us, Lord, because you said you would be where two or three gather together. And we pray that we'll, uh, as we take bread and wine together, our hearts will be filled with gratitude to you. We will recognize that, that what you have done for us is so vast and immense that all eternity we'll be praising you. And uh, so we, we ask, Lord, uh, that you'll help us to, uh, to bring this conference to a close in the right way, giving honor and glory to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. 
For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are, sorry, to, chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, sorry, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. But by the, his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I, come to you, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God prepared before the ages for our glory. The, excuse me, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age had understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches out all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, Yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. And just preparing to come around the communion, I do want to just read also from, from 1 Corinthians 11. But I, I just want to say some words about 1 Corinthians 1. But let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. And, uh, and verse, uh, when I find it, 23, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And this is my text. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Apostle Paul here says that he's received by revelation or from the Lord Jesus himself uh, that, that whenever we break bread and whenever we, uh, whenever we take that cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. But isn't, doesn't it sound odd somehow? So, like, countercultural, because proclaiming somebody's death, you know what I mean? It's like you get biographies of people, and their death might have been very dramatic. But a biography, you would go through somebody's birth, and then you would see them growing up as a child and all their siblings and all this, that, and the other, and eventually you'd get to their death. But that was the end then, wasn't it? In fact, it says in Scripture, you know, that a man's plans stop when he dies, you know, or, or a person who's hoarded up treasure for, him, for himself, when he dies, he can't take it with him. Whose will, will it be? So why would anybody... Spend all this time proclaiming somebody's death. The Gospels are not really like biographies. I mean, yes, Luke tells us a little bit about Jesus when he went up to the temple in his young days and so on, but very little of anything else. And, of course, the Apocrypha tells us all sorts of things, like like Jesus was a carpenter and he made this bird out of wood and then set it for... I'm thinking to myself, well, I think he didn't need to make a bird out of wood in the first place, so why did he need to do it the second time? We don't have that sort of thing, but we do have a disproportionate amount of the Gospels on the death of Jesus. And not only that, we get into the New Testament further, and the epistles are all about it as well, the death of Jesus. And I won't be surprised if there aren't somebody here this morning, wearing a necklace with a cross on, or some jewellery with a cross on. And actually, if you go and look at some churches, they're actually built in the shape of a cross. They have a long centre aisle, and then they have two cross pieces. They're built in the shape of a cross. But you know something? I've never seen anybody wearing an electric chair around their neck, (laughs) or or a noose. I suppose it might come, having seen those horrible photos of uh, of Celine, you know, whatever her name was, with a a baby with with, um, skulls on. But, But you just don't do that. So proclaiming his death, you know, to just imagine it. Well, today we're going to talk about somebody's death. I remember my uncle was a preacher, and he, he once uh, decided he was going to talk about death <laughs> in, in a, a church in Blackpool. So he, he went there, and he preached this sermon, and the lady said, I'm never going to hear him again. <laughs> so, here in this passage of Scripture, imagine reading this. The Apostle Paul says, now, the message that we have, he says, he says, to Jews, it's a stumbling block. (laughs) And then he says, and to Greeks, and that's the rest. It's foolishness. So he says, I have a message that if I take it to the Jews, it's a stumbling block to them. And if I take it to the Gentiles, they think, how have you ever heard such rubbish in your life? There's a place in Scripture that says that there are a way that a man thinks is right, but the end of it is the way of death. And the gospel to, to human minds is a, an offense. It comes as an offense because it says to everybody, no, you're not going to naturally float into heaven. 
No, you aren't a good person. You're a sinner. And what's more, you can't save yourself. You see, there are some churches today who go for seeker-friendly services. They say, on Sunday, or on the Lord's Day, or whenever you meet, let's not talk about things that are difficult for people. I tell you what, we'll do that on Tuesday or whatever, but on Sunday, we'll put two chairs on, we'll have a discussion. When we were going to do lots of major building work at the church up the road, we had an architect come in and he says, what we could do is, we take this pulpit out of here because you don't want to be preached at nowadays. Oh, I said, oh no. I said, I've, al I've always wanted a church with a pulpit in the center. So we're not doing that. So he was really shocked. I said, the gospel is not something up for discussion. It is God saying to human beings, repent. It's not the man in the pulpit saying, I'm better than you, and I've arrived today to tell you all what you want to do. It's nothing like that. It's the proclamation of God. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says, Jesus gave me this. And he said, you know something? I've decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So clever people with clever schemes to make people feel good. You know, let's have a nice amusing talk today. When I left college and I went to, we went, Janice and I, we went to uh, a little town called Audlem in Cheshire from college and they gave us 11 churches to look after out of 20 odd that were in this Methodist circuit. And when we were there, I think it must have been a young minister, went out of college to a Church of England church. And all the rumours were, we don't like this guy. He makes us look like a lot of wrong uns. <laughs> he said, well, you know, why don't you go out there and preach to them folk outside? We are in church. Just imagine a vicar turning up and calling you all sinners. I mean, dear me, it's not, it shouldn't be done in polite society, should it? The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And so it's not clever schemes because believe it or not, the Apostle Paul could have spoken on most of the subjects that anybody wanted him to speak on. Because he could go to Athens and he could reason with the philosophers and he could talk about what they had said, you know, in him we move and have our being and all that sort of thing. He could, he could debate it, he wanted to. But you know something amongst the Jews? He had studied at the best university, if I want to put it like that. He was under Gamaliel and he calls himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And if any Jew wanted to argue with him about status, he said, you know, well, let, bring it on. You know, in Philippians chapter 3, he goes through a whole list that he could have been proud of. Fleshly, he could have, he could have said about himself. But then he says, I count all those. The Bible's very polite. As dung that I may gain Christ. I determined to know nothing among you. I made a specific decision, determination, that my job was not to bring some amusing talk to people and make them all feel good. My job was to preach Christ. And not only that, Christ crucified. This offensive thing. Oh, you don't think it's offensive. You know something? The Jews, sorry, the Romans, if you were a Roman citizen, you couldn't, die, you couldn't be executed by crucifixion. Oh, no. It was an offense even to Romans. And after a few hundred years, they banned it as well. It was a terrible thing. You could hang on a cross for hours, pushing up and trying to breathe and so on. It's unbelievable torture. It's an offensive thing. So 
Why do we talk about the cross so much? What's so important about this? Why does he say, I determine to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified? Paul said here, didn't he, as often as you do this, you proclaim his death until he comes. We take bread and we take wine. We remember Jesus breaking it. It was unleavened bread. There was no sin in him. It was striped and pierced like a, a, a sorry, the mat says striped and pierced like he, he was. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep, all of us have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. As we look at the cross, that's what we deserve. We deserve to be banished from the presence of God and lost for all eternity. But the good news, folks, is that he who never sinned, he who is God from all eternity, the second person of the Trinity, became man, came into this mess, endured the contradiction of sinners for us, and then went to that cross. And, and in spite of what Steve Chalk says, Jesus said one, one word from him, 12 legions of angels would have delivered him. This is not cosmic child abuse, folks. Before the beginning of time, in, if you can put it like this, just for our understanding, before the beginning of time in the council of the Godhead, this was planned because the Bible says he's the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. It wasn't the Father saying, right, you, you go and you're going to die. No, no, <laughs> no. Who can ever comprehend what it costs the Father? Who could ever comprehend what it costs the Son? Who could ever understand? It says angels long to look into these things. It's absolutely staggeringly amazing. And why? You see, we're living in an age where we've, we've cut off We've disconnected the Old Testament from the New Testament. I had a, a Methodist minister friend who called himself an evangelical, but he said, I'm not an Old Testament man, I'm a New Testament man. I'm a New Testament. He preached from the New Testament, not the Old Testament. <coughs> I'm thinking, how on earth do you understand the New Testament? What on earth is the cross about? What were they doing that night when they broke bread? What was that about? Well, you can't know, can you? You've just disconnected it from the Old Testament. It was Passover. Passover, what does that mean? Well, the Jews know what it means. They regularly celebrate Pesach. And they remember that night on that 10th plague where this superpower, Egypt, was forced by the living God to set his people free. When the angel of death passed over, and listen, the angel of death didn't go, is there anybody in here who's a really wicked person? No, he didn't say, nothing like that happened. What happened was, if there was blood on the lintels and the door, lintel and the doorposts, the angel of death passed over. If there wasn't, the firstborn of everybody in that family, that home, their animals and everything died. And you imagine that. You imagine Pharaoh, who was supposed to be a god, he couldn't do anything about it. And his own firstborn died. <laughs> and not only that, how could... Anybody know what was the firstborn of that animal, or this animal, or that? But they all died. You know, Farmer Giles there was thinking, wow, that calf died. And the others are still alive. God showed his power in a tremendous way. And for all of us here, folks, 
it's the blood that makes means that we're saved. It's not of us. You know, we 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 we're all in the same boat. It says, "Let him who boasts boast in the Lord." If I read from you from Ephesians to, to you from Ephesians chapter two, you probably can say it off by heart. For it is by grace. We are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. Can you imagine what heaven would be like if it was like, say, a university open day? <laughs> what, what grades did you, Oh, oh, I see. It was a, yours was only a 2-3, was it? Oh, yeah, well, well our, our George, he got a... Uh, he got, oh, it's not going to be like that. We're all going to be looking at Jesus. Because but for him, we would all be lost. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is none righteous. No, not one. But God commended his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, I, you'll have to forgive me, but I am a Manchester United fan. <laughs> uh, and for many years, uh, when I was a youngster, I used to go across and see the team bus come in. And one day, there was a guy standing in the crowd, and he had a big placard on the front, all about being saved. And I remember as clear as anything, Dennis Law pointing to him, and they were all laughing on the bus. But I thought, oh, it's not a laughing matter. People know the word saviour, salvation, save. They'll laugh at somebody. Are you saved, brother? They'll laugh at him and so on. But we used to live in the Isle of Man. And my wife doesn't like ships and she doesn't like ships when they're going like that, but she certainly doesn't like them when they're going like this. <laughs> and so we had plenty of rough crossings to the Isle of Man in our time. They were there eight years. And I thought, you know, if one day somebody falls over the side, they're not going to say, don't worry, you carry on, I'll just swim to the Isle of Man. <laughs> Somebody's going to need to save them, aren't they? <coughs> Throw a life belt in or... Or whatever, somebody's gonna have to save them. A life guard, a life belt, life is precious. Somebody needs to save them. But there are loads of people who think that they're just gonna float through life. I've done loads of funerals. I've never ever had anybody saying, Uncle George was a, oh, he was a terrible man. <laughs> they, they always tell me, oh, he would have done anything for anybody. <laughs> He's so good, and he would help old ladies across the road, and he would this, and if you needed anything, he would give it you. He's so generous. And was, Do you get the picture? The picture is, well, he was very good, so he'll be all right now. He's, he's gone to a better place. I've often stood in the pulpit up there and said, how do you know? He's gone to a better place. What if he's gone to a worse place? This is no laughing matter, though, is it? We all need... I could say we all need a saviour, but then somebody might think there's a whole selection of them. There isn't. We all need the saviour. We all need the cross of Jesus. And if we ever get to heaven, it will be a mighty miracle and it will be by the blood of Christ and none of us will be boasting. None of us, I'm going to say, oh, I was a Methodist minister, you know, and I used to, I used to, none of us will be boasting. We'll all be looking to Jesus, absolutely amazed. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a what? How many people think of themselves as wretches? Very good. I won't, I'm not counting. <laughs> the helplessness of man is the offence of it all, isn't it? 
But for somebody who really, really has a burden upon their life and thinks nobody could ever save me, if you knew what I'd done, if you knew what I'd thought, if you knew what I'd said, if you knew where I'd been, you know something, take a journey to the foot of the cross and ask yourself, who is that? It's the Son of God. What, you mean that God, who could, have, who could have, in a word, swept us all into hell, could have destroyed this world just like that in, in the flood, and there might have been no Noah or anybody else that's been gracious to us? Is it, isn't it amazing that Jesus, this, this hymn is not in the Methodist hymn book or any hymn book that I've got, so this is the Billy Graham uh, one. Listen to this. Alas, and did my Saviour bleed, and did my Sovereign die, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done, he groaned upon the tree, amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. It is all that I can do. Christians come around the table of the Lord with joy in their heart. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? It's it is the death of Jesus that is the good news. Good Friday, we call it, not because the scene was great. It was so terrible that God closed down the scene in darkness. And Isaiah 53 says that he, it was almost like he wasn't human. He was bearing the sins of the world. And this son of God, who had never been separated from his Father from all eternity, is saying, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? But for that sinner standing at the foot of the cross, who thinks their sins are too, too, too big to be forgiven, there's an old hymn that says, My trespass was grown up to heaven, but far above the skies. In Christ abundantly forgiven, I see thy mercies rise. Or here's another one. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. See all your sins on Jesus lay, laid. The Lamb of God was slain. His soul was once an offering made for every soul of man. That, that's where we are. But there's one other thing. You know how sometimes people will say, oh, you know, it's my dad's birthday today and he died last year. You know, we're going to remember this. To be honest, I always try to remember my parents' birthdays and so on and people in our families is when so-and-so died. But this is one thing you don't say. Oh, I remember Uncle George. Oh, he was a good man and... You know, and, and, but he died on, what date is it today? 18th of November last year or something like that. And we're going to remember him until he comes. <laughs> people, people say, oh, that's it, he's finally flipped. <laughs> but this is what it says here. We're proclaiming his death till he comes. You know what? Death couldn't hold him. Yes, amen. On the third day, he rose from the dead. 
He said it's finished. God said it's finished. He raised him from the dead. He's alive. We have a living Savior. When we pray this morning, we know he's with us. We can pray in his name. The Father sees. When we're praying for people, the blood of Jesus. So he can be gracious on that basis to every single one of us. Can't he? And this is why we proclaim the death of Jesus. Amen. And this is why when we break bread and we take wine together, the bread doesn't become the body of Jesus, but we can know his presence with us in an amazing way. And the trouble is with the things we're familiar with. I don't know whether you go to communion regularly and you, you go, oh, well, this is how we do it, and yeah, bread, wine, and so on. It's very easy not to re realize the absolute seriousness of what we do and the stunning fact of God's love for us in this amazing way. So I'd sometimes say to my congregation, well, we're, we're coming together, we're coming around the Lord's table because we used to come up to the front to do it. And, uh, and I'd say to them, you know, like we're in fellowship with one another, but forget the person next to you now and imagine Jesus here. Bringing his life, forgiveness, and peace to you. Maybe you want to do that today. It won't be because there's some kind of magic that I can do. <laughs> it's because we're doing what Jesus told us to do. As all over the world today, Christians are meeting. They're meeting looking back to the cross. They're meeting looking on to his return because he's risen from the dead and seated at the right hand of God and all power and authority is given to him and by his spirit he's here with us today and you know he loves you I want to say though this this is only for believers so if you haven't yet repented of your sins and if you haven't yet put your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus, what he did for you upon that cross. If you're still holding on somehow to thinking that because you're good or something like that or because you did it your way, in the words of that famous singer, you'll get there and it will, you know, and so on. It, then please don't take bread and wine today. Come and see us after. Come and see Jacob and, and talk about it. So if you're a believer, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're welcome to take bread and wine, otherwise just let it pass along uh, before you. Uh, I know Graham Kendrick is not everybody's favourite singer, but I had a CD once, he used to play this regularly in my car because it's a quote from scripture, and it says this, no one whose hope is in him will ever be put to shame. That's why my eyes are on you, O Lord. And there's an old hymn, none other lamb, None other name, none other hope in heaven or earth or sea, none other hiding place from guilt and shame, none beside thee. We proclaim it. What good news for sinners. We proclaim his death and his resurrection because Jesus is alive, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our friend.